Welcome to Chapter 6, Cognitive Development in Infancy. When we talk about Piaget, we're talking about cognitive development. Piaget believed that individuals learned through their own direct behavior. Uh, it's individual exploration and that our direct motor behavior is what we learn through. And it's not that we acquire from facts. It is not that we are getting it from other people. It's uh, action equals knowledge. Action equals knowledge is an important thing to think about when we think about Piaget and individual exploration. Piaget's theories are supported through stages. He believed we all pass through four stages of development. Sensory motor, zero to two years old. Pre-operational, two to seven years old. Concrete operational is about seven to 12 years old. And then formal operational is from 12 years old through adulthood. And he also believed not everyone reached that highest level of formal operational development. Piaget believed that we take in information uh, through assimilation and accommodation. And if you look at the root words for assimilation, it's assimilate to make the same as. And so assimilation is when we take a new situation or a new learning experience and we fit it into our current way of thinking, how we already think of things. And we try to fit it into that. Accommodation is when we make changes to our current way of thinking to fit this new idea. I think the book talks about a flying squirrel, but uh, another example I like to think about is when you think of a baby, uh, and babies put everything in their mouths. So if you were to give them a rattle or keys, the first thing they would probably do would be to put those keys or that rattle into their mouth because that's what they do. That's how they assimilate new things. Um, so they would assume probably that they would get milk from it as you would a bottle or a breast for a baby. But then all of a sudden they realize, wait a minute, you know, I'm not getting milk from this bottle or these key these keys. No, wait, I'm not getting milk, but when I shake it, it makes a really cool sound. So the assimilation part is when they first took that new thing, the keys or the rattle, and they put it into their old way of thinking, which is, oh, I put it in my mouth because I get milk from it. But then when they realize that didn't happen, they then accommodate for the new thinking and they say, oh, wow, look at that. When I shake it, it makes a really cool sound. And so they've now accommodated. They've now changed and made new thinking um, instead of just fitting into their previous way of thinking. Piaget said that we all have schemes. These are uh, our background knowledge, our prior knowledge, prior experiences that we build on. And so we fit our new uh, learning into our schema. Schema being S-C-H-E-M-A. You'll hear that term a lot in education. Uh, and it's merely it's making connections to children's background knowledge and prior knowledge. This chart is in your textbook on page 144. So we mentioned Piaget's four stages, but that first stage, sensory motor. Uh, just to talk about that, if you look at the word sensory motor and you take the two root words, you have sense and you have motor. What do babies do during those first two years of life? Well, they take things in through their senses. They see, they smell, they taste, they hear, they touch. Uh, they motor, they move. They go from thinking about the pincer grass with fine motor development, wrapping their fingers around another person's finger, uh, for, to pulling themselves up and rolling themselves over and standing and crawling and running and jumping. So a lot of what babies do during those first two years of their life is um, it's called sensory motor according to Piaget and they're taking things in through their senses and they're motoring, moving. So it's a good way to be able to remember that. However, having those uh, that sensory motor stage, actually, it's there's a lot of different things going on in the first day of life, and you think about second birthday, there's a lot of differences going on. So he breaks that first stage, uh, sensory motor, into six sub-stages. The first sub-stage is simple reflexes. Uh, that's the first month of life, and it's really about them really having those automatic reflexes, the sucking reflex. Um, the second substage, first habits and primary circular reactions, is the first month to through the fourth month. The uh, third substage is secondary circular reactions, four to eight months. The fourth is coordination of secondary circular reactions. That's up from about eight months to a year. Then you have substage five, tertiary circular reactions. That's a year to a year and a half. And then they call substage six from 18 months to two years the beginnings of thought. 
Please take the time to look in your book. This chart is on page 144, and you can read about each of the substages from page 144 through page 147. I'm not going to take all the time to cover it right now, but a couple of the important things to think about are that first stage, where it's just the simple reflexes, and we'll talk more about reflexes later. And then later on in substage four, Four is when they accomplish and achieve object permanence, and that's things like peekaboo uh, is a good game to teach that because it's when children learn that just because I can't see something doesn't mean it's not there. Quick overview, substage one, again, simple reflexes. The uh, baby's world is really just based on how they're interacting with it as far as their reflexes. Substage two is coordinating their different actions into integrated activities, starting to focus and understanding on their own body. Substage three is when they start to act on the outside world. Substage four, as we mentioned, it's a lot of goal-directed behavior, kind of doing things with intent. I always think before that, uh, when we were back in substage one, two, and three, especially two and three, uh, children, I picture a baby laying in a crib reaching up to their mobile and they bat at the mobile but they don't realize they're not doing it on purpose and then maybe one day they hit the mobile they realize music plays and eventually they're realizing that oh i did that and once that happens i think that that's sort of the beginning of goal-directed behavior when they're realizing they're doing things with intent and they're having an impact on the outside world substage five is a lot about schemes and looking to do things to bring about desired uh, consequences and results. I think a lot of times we think babies are doing things to be spiteful. You'll see a baby in their high chair and they throw their spoon overboard and they throw their oatmeal over the side of a high chair and then they laugh and it seems in some ways I think people think kids are doing that out of spite but in reality they're really just experimenting. Oh I wonder what this spoon will sound like when it bounces off the side of the couch or uh, you know, I wonder if this oatmeal will make a cool splat, or I wonder what my parents' reaction will be on their face when they see me do this. And I think um, it's a lot of experimenting kids are doing, and parents often, I think, may get frustrated because it feels like it's intentionally to drive them crazy, where it's really just intentionally to experiment. Substage six, beginnings of thought. There's a lot of mental representation, uh, pretend play, where you picture maybe a child sees trucks on the road and they go home and they play with their trucks, or a child sees someone playing with a baby and then they go home and play with their doll, um, or imitating behavior that is no longer in front of them. Maybe they saw a parent driving the car earlier because they were sitting in the back seat and then later on they're playing pretend and pretending to be driving. As with all of the theories and theorists we talk about, there's people who are supportive and, and agree with the things that theorists say, but then there's, says, but then there's people who disagree. Some of the critics, uh, when it comes to Piaget, uh, some people say maybe you don't have to go through one stage to get to the next. Some people say uh, that children, some kids reach object permanence. Uh, abilities at a much earlier age. Some people say culture can come into play. Um, so there's a lot, and you definitely want to look at th that in the book, there's a lot talked about um, that can influence why or why not uh, people agree or disagree with Piaget's findings and theories. When we talk about cognitive development, we also talk about the information processing approach. Uh, and this is really all about how we use information, how we take in information, how we use it, and how we store it. So we have encoding, storage and retrieval. That's how we take in, store, and process information. Um, encoding is how we record it um, in initially. So a lot of times I've seen analogy, I think it's in the textbook as well, um, comparing how we do this to a computer. And they say that the sort of, at the top of page 150 in your book, there's an example, and it looks at the keyboard as the encoding, how we put the information in. Then it shows a picture of a disk. Kind of think about the hard drive for how we store it. And then you can think about the screen, the monitor, or the printer for how we retrieve it so that we can go back and get it when we need it again. So if you think about all the bits of information you take in on a day-to-day -day basis, some of it's more important than others, and some of it you need to remember for later, and some you don't. So when you think about the information processing approach, it's about how we kind of decide which information stays and which doesn't, um, and how we process and encode the information that we do decide to keep.
Sometimes when we want to remember something, it's quite intentional. We go back and try to recall it. And sometimes we don't even think about it. If you've ever driven someplace and all of a sudden you realize you've arrived and you don't remember how you got there because you've driven that route so many times, your car almost seems like it's going on automatic. Um, like your car knows the route better than you do in some ways, but it's almost that you've done it so many times, it becomes very automatic. Um, and so this is a big piece. If you think about the process of learning a new skill, learning to ride a bike, learning to read, the first time you try something new, it's really hard. If the first time you take your feet off the ground, when you want to ride a bike, the very first time you do it, you really have to think about each part. Um, put one, pick one foot up, pick the other foot up, balance. But then once you've been riding a bike for a while, you don't even think about it. You get on and you hop on and next thing you know, you're at the store doing whatever you're doing. Same with driving a car. The first time when you first started driving a car, you would get in, you, put, you have to think about putting your seatbelts on, you check your mirrors, you look in the rear view mirror, and now you do all those things, but you don't even realize that you still do them. Research shows that even from very early on, babies have memory. Uh, memory is that whole process of how we take in information, store it, and retrieve it later on. Um, we can tell that babies have memory very early on, but recognizing people they know that they've seen before, um, toys. Um, we'll talk further about habituation, which is uh, a good sign of um, how quickly children become accustomed to new toys and look for more stim stimuli. Research suggests that memory during infancy is dependent upon part of the brain, the hippocampus, and that at a later age, this involves additional structures of the brain, and so that as we get older, the parts of our brain that use memory can adapt and change. I'm hoping someone will remind me in class on, um, on Monday to talk about infantile amnesia and memory. One of the things I like to ask students, and I'm hoping somebody will remind me about this, so if you want to write that in your notebook with a star, remind the teacher, uh, I'd like to talk about get examples of your earliest memories. Um, when we think back of early memories from when we were two or three or four years old, uh, according to most research, we have what's called infantile amnesia, so we can't actually remember things that happened prior to the age of three. However, you still remember how to walk and how to talk. You learned how to do those before the age of three, so that's a different kind of memory. But if you could remind me in class, I'd love to go around the room and kind of see what people remember from what they think of as their very early or earliest memories. Uh, and if you can think of something right now and write it down, if you could mention it in class. Ex explicit memory is conscious memory. It's memory that you can recall very intentionally and think of specifically. Um, implicit memory is recalled unconsciously. So those might be your motor habits, activities, things like that that you don't even realize you're doing. What is infant intelligence? It's hard to determine what makes a baby smart. Uh, a lot of different experts have different opinions on what it is that makes a baby smart. On page 153 in your book, they give a few examples, and you can read a little more about it. The developmental quotient, the Bailey scale of infant development, and visual recognition memory. I would pay more attention to the developmental quotient and the Bailey scale. There's some examples in the book. This chart just looks, you know, at the typical two-month-old. They show a mental scale and a motor scale. What can they do cognitively? What can they do physically? So just turning their head, reacting to the disappearance of a face as a mental activity, holding their head up, uh, sitting without support, and then going all the way down to a almost four-year-old, naming different colors, using past tense, copying a circle, uh, hopping in one, on one foot, etc. Language is a really important part of cognitive development, where language, come from. language comes from, um, that it's a systematic, meaningful arrangement of symbols. Uh, that ba the basically, if you think about language as communication, then we have phonology, morphemes, and semantics. Remind me so we can talk about these in class, as so this video is only 15 minutes that I can record. So, uh, Prelinguistic communication is the uh, ba the gestures and the sounds and the facial expressions. Babbling is speech-like. Telegraphic speech. Um, so think about, I go store instead of I go to the store. Holla phrases, one word utterances. So I almost picture, picture a child standing in front of the fridge and they say milk. But what they're really saying is, would you get me some milk? Put it in my favorite cup. I'd like it now, please. But Underextension. Uh, is an example of when children use are too restrictive. So they might think the word blankie only means their blankie. You don't have a blankie. That's my blankie. Only I have a blankie. Overextension would be the the opposite, where it's too broad, overly broad generalizations. So if they think daddy, they call every man that walks by daddy. 
Referential style of language is pointing out objects, table, book, a mommy, daddy, expressive would be um, thinking about feelings and needs, how you express yourself rather than refer. So if you look at those root words, that's helpful. Pay attention in the book to the uh, section on the learning theory approach to how people learn how to read and to the nativist approach. Please read those sections of the chapter as well. Universal grammar uh, is part of the nativist approach uh, and the language acquisition device. You want to pay attention to those. Please remind me in class, make a note to talk about infant directed speech. That's an important topic. And let's look at these questions. Let's look at these questions in class.